Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm thrilled that you all are, are still here and are, uh, are here for what I think will be an extraordinarily interesting uh, and lively panel. The title of it is Internet Governance and Transition, What's the Destination? Uh, I, the good news is the destination is clearly Aspen, Colorado. Uh, that's always a good news. Uh, but I think the timing of this session is particularly important because uh, obviously, the internet, international aspects of internet governance have been much in the news recently. There are a wide variety of aspects that will be reflected on our panel and hopefully in the lively questions that will come from the floor. Uh, we have had, um, in particular uh, at this moment, I think we're in an inflection uh, time. We had, in December of 2012, uh, at the ITU, the WICET, the World Conference on Infra International Telecommunications, uh, that focused tremendous attention around the world on the issue of internet governance. Uh, since then, we've also had the Snowden revelations that has created tremendous turmoil internationally. Uh, we had Net Mundial uh, in Brazil this past year. And at the same time, we've had uh, a series of decisions and um, uh, movement with regard to ICANN, including perhaps most notably the decision by the U.S. government, the administration, as announced by Larry Strickland at NTIA about a transition in the role and relationship between the U.S. government and ICANN. And since then, uh, the series of, uh, of uh, procedures that ICANN has put into place with regard to that transition as well as its own accountability. While at the same time, we are now starting to do another pivot uh, back to the ITU, uh, which has been relatively quiet since uh, Wicket, but we have uh, in October of this year, uh, the Plenipotentiary, which is a treaty writing conference that will determine the jurisdiction and scope of activities of the ITU for the next four years, as well as the elections for the senior leadership of that important organization. We have, in about two weeks from now, uh, the Internet Governance Forum meeting again, as it annually does, this year in Istanbul, that promises to be particularly lively and interesting uh, because of issues such as uh, net neutrality, as it's being discussed internationally, uh, as well as the future of the uh, IGF itself. And next year, as we are also ramping up, we will have the 10th anniversary of the World Summit on the Information Society which, as you know, was a Heads of State UN summit that was held in 2003 and 2005. And as is traditional at the UN, on the 10th anniversary, uh, there will be a substantial review. And that review process is now starting and will really kick into gear starting next uh, June. And we'll conclude with a major uh, meeting uh, in New York as part of the UN General Assembly, uh, that promises to be a very important UN meeting because it will determine in large part what uh, the future of the World Summit on the Information Society, the WISIS, Tunis agenda and follow-up are likely to be. We've got a terrific panel, uh, an extraordinary panel, really. Uh, I will not read their bios. You all have that. We have uh, two, uh, two uh, changes to the original panel. Uh, Ajit Pai, uh, Commissioner Pai, was not able to join us because of uh, some extended circumstances. So Shane Tews is going to play the role of Ajit Pai. Uh, and then, unfortunately, Wolfgang Croft was also unable to, to join us uh, for medical reasons at the last minute. And we're very lucky that we have Reinhardt to, uh, to join us and to give us uh, a European and international perspective on many of these issues as well. What we're going to do is have uh, very short uh, initial presentations by each of our panelists, uh, and then we'll have a lot of Q&A both during and after that. Uh, our first uh, speaker will be Ambassador Danny Sepulva, who everyone knows, uh, so he really needs no introduction. Uh, but we are extraordinarily fortunate to have him leading us uh, on all of these issues, but in particular of the upcoming Plenty Potential, where he'll be leading the U.S. delegation. Danny? Uh, thank you very much. 
much, David. Um, as you all know, David was the former me in the other <laughs> administration. Uh, I, he has uh, provided valuable and, and uh, much appreciated advice during this entire process over the last year and a half as we've been trying to ensure that we are able to preserve the existing system of internet governance as it's structurally formulated in the sense that it is a multi-stakeholder process. For those of you who don't live and breathe this stuff every day, by the multi-stakeholder process, what we're trying to achieve is a mechanism of essentially participatory democracy for the governance of the internet in which all stakeholders who have an interest in its outcomes are able to participate on equal footing on the decisions that are made relative to the execution of norms, rules, and standards for the operation and future of the internet. Uh, the most obvious uh, uh, incarnation of this is the critical infrastructure managed by ICANN, the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, uh, and we can talk a little bit about, uh, and, and Steve and, and, uh, and Shane have extensive expertise uh, on ICANN and can talk about where that process stands and, and where NTIA's work is headed on that as well. I'm happy to answer questions to that effect as well. In terms of the larger plenipotentiary conference that we're going to at the end of this year, the goal is to ensure that uh, those, of, those who were not with us in 2012 at the Wicket uh, understand that we are fully committed to ensuring that the issues that they care about, issues of inclusiveness and the governance of the network worldwide, issues of cybersecurity, issues of uh, privacy, issues of, 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 uh, of economics relative to access, that these are all issues that we care about as well. There are some issues uh, among those that the ITU can add some value, but as a general rule, the vast majority of internet-related public policy issues are better dealt with in other institutions. We will bring to the argument what those institutions are and potential solutions. And at the same time, we are working through uh, multiple efforts, including the Internet Governance Forum and what was the Net Mundial Conference and will become the Net Mundial Initiative to give life to the idea of how we can address the remaining and outstanding concerns of folks, particularly from developing world democracies, relative to access to opportunity and access to the internet, as well as security for their folks, um, going forward in a manner that is multi-stakeholder and draws on all the expertise available to decision makers and policy makers from the multi-stakeholder community. So with that, I think it'd be better if we just, just engage well, in a conversation. True, and, and part of that conversation, uh, perhaps Danny, you might address, there obviously, we're now starting to see a lot of the proposals come into the, uh, for the, in preparation for the Plenty Pot from various countries and so forth. We have some series of proposals. You were just down at CTEL, uh, very actively reaching out, engaging with our, our colleagues uh, uh, in the Americas. What are you seeing as the ones that are going to be the most troublesome, the ones that are difficult, and undoubtedly will have good outcomes from it, but the ones that are, uh, are, that are problematic and that people ought to know that are being discussed internationally about charging regimes and things of that nature? Uh, so in terms of proposals, there are obviously proposals that are simple non-starters for us and on which we're not going to get to yes with Russia, China, and, and some Middle East countries relative to content issues on the internet, people's ability to speak freely in particular. Um, there are issues on the economic fronts relative to some dissatisfaction among policymakers in the developing world relative to, for example, interconnection costs and the prices that people are paying internationally in the developing world for access to the internet. Um, there are also concerns about the degree to which they are consumers of a service rather than producers in a market and mechanisms by which the economics of the internet can be more inclusive of, of producers in the, in the global south. What we've responded to those uh, concerns with is uh, trying to do a much better and deeper analysis of why it is that, that prices are higher for access in the global south. Even though they are dropping fairly dramatically, we have three times more submarine cables entering Africa this year than we did three years ago. We see an uptick there. Internally, what you're seeing is ISOC doing incredible work along with others for internet exchange points to ensure that traffic is being routed more efficiently internally and reducing if, at least latency, if not cost, and then injections through the Alliance for Affordable Internet and other public policy initiatives to encourage competition and investment in markets 
around the world. Our fundamental point is that you aren't going to solve these problems through the centralized regulations coming out of the United Nations, that these are really market by market challenges that require a policy solution that creates a legal and regulatory environment that encourages investment and encourages the development of the skills of folks on the ground to use their access. So that would be point one. And then point two, the idea is to not look at the internet or information communications technologies and communications uh, networks as an end in themselves, but rather as a platform for development. That a truly strong communications platform, whether or not it is produced in your country, acts as a springboard for uh, efficient and effective development of services and goods throughout the entire economy. So from everything, and we see it in everything from agriculture to where farmers are using uh, connectivity to better understand markets and to better understand weather patterns coming in the future to how women are using it uh, for health purposes in different parts of the world to um, to how to how citizens are using it to access and, and, and challenge incumbent authority whether that be political or, or corporate and so w there is something very I think this is a, a good news story for us um, and we need to tell it as a good news story we need to highlight the folks in the parts of the world who are not connected to their government in a political way but are doing incredible things technologically so for example in South Africa where we have somewhat of a challenge in communicating with the government why we believe so strongly in the system and why they should participate in it as believers in democracy and free markets as well that uh, to highlight the voices of tech entrepreneurs in South Africa which exist and it's a matter of connecting these communities to each other. So toward that end, Patrick Gaspard, the, our current ambassador to South Africa, and I will be doing a DVC on Thursday this morning, a digital video conference with activists in South Africa, and trying to, and we're going to be inviting um, as government officials as well to talk about what the exciting and potential opportunities are of an open internet for South Africa. So that's terrific. That's no, that, that's picture. terrific. Steve, as chairman of uh, the board of ICANN, you must often feel like you're in the center of a, an extraordinary storm, but one with, uh, with incredible and important global uh, reach and uh, impact. You're also in the middle of a huge transition as well. Uh, can you describe a little bit about what's going on at ICANN these days? What's the real inside story? The inside story. The inside story is the, sitting in the eye of the hurricane. Um, uh, listen carefully to everything that Danny said, and I hope that you did too, because I'm going to come back to it. I'll say a word about ICANN uh, and then come back to what Danny said. I, I think it's helpful to think of ICANN as having um, kind of two um, roles uh, in a practical sense. Uh, one that gets a lot of discussion, uh, particularly since the Department of Commerce announcement in mid-March, is what we call the IANA function, which is a record-keeping uh, function uh, that is of service to the uh, operators of the domain name system, a service to the uh, regional internet registries that allocate uh, IP space uh, addresses, and uh, of service to the Internet Engineering Task Force for the myriad of uh, <coughs> protocol parameters that are published. Uh, the other uh, activity that uh, greatly occupies ICANN is uh, management of a set of contracts with what we call the generic top-level domain operators, uh, both the registrars and the registries. Uh, and in that sense uh, is, um, our general counsel is going to kill me, but is a, uh, in a light sense, a regulatory uh, type of function or a market-making and, and grooming function. Um, the, the, um, the announcement in March was that the Department of Commerce uh, signaled its intention to uh, end the formal contractual relationship with ICANN regarding the IANA function uh, with the intent clearly stated that things are going well and that should continue to go well and that uh, we could uh, continue, we could, should continue to operate that function, which is exactly what ICANN was constructed to do in the first place. It was uh, purpose built to house the IANA function. Um, that's uh, created quite a lot of uh, notice and uh, discussion uh, uh, around the world uh, and raised uh, collateral questions about, well, what is this ICANN anyway? Is it, uh, how can we trust it? Uh, how accountable is it? Uh, and a lot of mixed agendas. The, the base agenda in all of this is, is the IANA function going to continue to operate as smoothly and as uh, uh, reliably as it has? And the answer is an unequivocal yes. Um, but there's 
always been a, a sense that, well, uh, there's recourse through the U.S. government if anything should go wrong, or there's recourse through the U.S. government if uh, on the other aspects, the, uh, the part related to um, uh, interacting with the market, um, people can bring pressure um, through the U.S. government. Um, the, the most important thing that I would say, particularly in the light of this panel and this, this discussion, is that this is a discussion about Internet governance writ large, and almost none of the important Internet governance issues are ICANN's. Uh, it's not about ICANN. It's about everything else. Um, and what's sometimes confusing is the natural next question is, well, what is the other, what, what else is there? Uh, one direction to go is the UN, the ITU, and so forth. Uh, and if you don't want a multilateral government uh, uh, and UN-based system, then how do you fill in the vacuum there? And that's been actually a challenge for the whole life of the Internet. Uh, various issues arise, economic issues and uh, uh, cross-border crime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was looking at the agenda here. Every single one of the topics uh, that's listed here uh, that we've spent our time on in this meeting is an internet governance issue. It is not an ICANN issue, however. So um, the, I, I couldn't be happier with the leadership that Danny has uh, been giving this area and the recitation that he went through because it allows me to hide behind him <laughs> and uh, have him lead all of the discussions on internet governance. Well, on, on, let me just ask Steve if I could. Uh, one of the pieces on that, uh, the process going forward, uh, is uh, the creation of this transition coordinating group uh, that was just, uh, just constituted. Can you give us a sense of what you see as the timeline? Uh, because it's relevant, of course, to issues such as what's going on at the ITU next year at WSIS and so forth, plus 10 and like. How do you see the time frames associated with the both the transition piece, but also the accountability, which as Fadi Shahadi, ICANN CEO, has indicated, are tied together. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. So there are two tracks. One is um, uh, discussion of the mechanics of what uh, changes uh, are needed, if any, uh, and, and there are some, at least some mechanical changes that are needed uh, with the uh, cessation of the uh, contract with the, uh, NTIA. Uh, and then uh, the um, related question of looking more broadly at ICANN as an organization and how accountable it is. Uh, I wasn't sure which uh, coordinated committee you were talking about because there's, uh, in effect, in slightly different ways, one associated with each of those, a different one for each of those. Um, the, um, the nominal time frame for the whole thing is to uh, match up with the end of the current contract, which is September 30th next year. So uh, there are options for extending the contract and there's options for um, setting aside all of that timeline. But that is the, the baseline that everybody is working toward and is where the expectations are set. So we can take that timeline and work backwards. And uh, the answer is everything has to happen much faster than it actually is. Um, meanwhile, the people who are intimately involved in it are trying to uh, proceed very, very carefully and uh, thoughtfully and um, sort of pursue a lot of procedural issues before getting to any of the content issues. I, I have to confess that it makes me a bit nervous uh, and I'm sort of holding my breath to see how all of this is going to come out. Come out. Um, so I don't know exactly what the timeline is. I'm, I'm not sure the there are people who are focused on the interrelationship of these processes with the ITU. I'm sure Danny is. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it more just in its own terms. Uh, my hope is that substantive uh, proposals start to uh, appear and gain the uh, uh, attention and discussion, be the object of discussion, uh, within the next month or two. Well, speaking about accountability and proposals and so forth, uh Larry, can you give us a little sense? This is an area that you and Tom have been very active in. Sure. Uh, and Steve, you said you were going to try to hide behind Danny. Sorry, I'm not going to let you. Uh, and uh, the A word, accountability, really is uh, the important thing. Um, and if you look at ICANN's current governance structure, uh, and if you look for more than 35 seconds, you start to get a headache. Uh, 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Uh, and if you, unfortunately, if you think about what are the alternatives, and you think for more than 35 seconds, the headache gets even worse. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to have some sort of magic uh, um, uh, answer here. Tom and I uh, have come up with a proposal that I will mention briefly that I think is the best of the possible outcomes. It's not perfect, uh, and you could probably point out a lot of potential headaches with it. But I think it, it certainly focuses on the accountability issue, and we think it gets it uh, pretty well. Now, let me first say at the very beginning, uh, you know, the ICANN function, the uh, IANA function has been well done. Uh, and uh, in some sense, we've been lucky. Uh, you can imagine bad things have, having happened in the past. They didn't. Um, around the edges, gee, I think, uh, I wish you guys had uh, expanded the number of GTLDs more and sooner. Uh, I'm a competition guy. My antitrust division uh, chief economist uh, hat says more competition. I wish you had. Uh, also, if I were um, a, a citizen of a country where Roman characters were not the standard alphabet, where it was a non-Roman alphabet, I might feel somewhat differently as well. But still, as a general matter, you know, here we are. We all rely heavily. Uh, our uh, modern commerce relies heavily. We've done a good job. Uh, but still, there's this nagging issue of accountability. And uh, the, you know, listening to the community, whatever that means, listening to lots of voice, and, and uh, uh, Albert Hirschman would be proud to hear the, you know, the word voice as part of the uh, current governance structure. Sure, it's better than nothing, uh, but it doesn't really address the accountability issue. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, accountability means that there are individuals, there are bodies that can take actions. And that's, you know, other than the Department of Commerce uh, link and contract, it ain't there right now. Now, the alternatives, though, as I said, also give you a headache. Uh, we for sure uh, wouldn't want a for-profit corporation uh, replacing uh, the nonprofit status of ICANN. Too much opportunity for reaping way too many rents. Um, just you know, shouldn't, and fortunately, that's not uh, on the table. You can imagine it as a government agency, but uh, then all the standard questions about government agencies and what their incentives are and what their goals are and which agency, which government, where, how, et cetera. You can imagine a uh, multi-government uh, governance structure, uh, the ITU uh, type of arrangement. But again, all the standard uh, issues of incentives, of political pressures, uh, of uh, just you know, how, how, do you, how do you ensure stability and the kind of progress we've seen uh, coming, up, uh, coming up there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Tom and I spent a lot of time thinking, talking back and forth about this, looking at uh, other similar organizations that have a strong standard setting uh, mission, standard setting function. And we concluded that having a governance structure where the direct users of the function, uh, in this case, it would be the registries, uh, the registrars, and the RIRs. Uh, having them as the uh, parties on the board of directors uh, and thereby providing that accountability to the organizations who are the direct users, who have a strong interest in a flourishing, progressive, 
uh, innovating internet would provide the right kind of accountability. Uh, again, the kind of accountability we see in other similar uh, standard setting uh, organizations. Um, just lastly, uh, let me just sort of say, as I have looked at some of the other proposals for accountability, um, either they you know, have this sort of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, community uh, rhetoric, and at the end of the day, I don't know what that really means in terms of accountability. It means a lot of voice, and again, voice has value. Um, and people feel very strongly, and that's, that's important, and letting them express that is important, but it isn't uh, uh, nearly enough. Uh, some proposals have sort of tried to establish a structure that almost looks like they're trying to create a quasi-governmental structure, that there should be, one of them, for example, said three separate parts to ICANN, a policy-making part, a policy administration part, and a dispute adjudication part, and they ought to be separate, and you, know, you immediately think of the US Constitution and the separation of powers and the three branches of government, and it felt like they were trying to recreate something like that. Well, you know, that may work for a real government, uh, and you can understand why you want that, and the uh, founders of the United States you know, were very wise in understanding that for a country, for a government. Is that the right way for an internet organization to be structured. Shane, is that, is that the right way to go? So let me stop there. Right. Accountability. Right. <laughs> Accountability. I think one of the challenges that ICANN has is we ask it to do a lot of things. So um, channeling Ajit for just a minute, mm -hmm. I would say one thing that they have not had a great track record on, and, and actually transparency is probably the more important part of this, is on contract compliance. So. You know, through one, as Steve mentioned, one of the things that ICANN does is they manage, um, you know, some contracts. They're about ready to manage thousands of contracts, and if you are um, in breach of that, which a lot of times happens when you, you know, you hear about people saying, "I'm not happy about something that's going on on the internet." There, you know, piracy. There's so what do you do about that? And there's just a little sliver of ICANN that can be helpful in that. Uh, it is their contract compliance. So um, I've, I've kind of toyed with the idea of, of promoting like a shot clock that says, I go in, I have the evidence package that shows that this domain name, the, the person who is leasing this domain name through the contract that ICANN provides through the registrar is doing something that's harmful. And I have the evidence and that, you know, what should ICANN do about that? Contract compliance could be a perfect place where they could show that they are accountable. And it'd be a very good place to start because they have all of the, everything's in place there. It's just a matter of being able to show a visible element of that happening. So a shot clock that says, I'm giving you 30 days to clean up your act or 90 days, whatever it is, and then you go dark. I'm gonna pull your domain name. Now they're gonna hopscotch around, but after a while that gets tiresome for everyone. And it's something that is, you know, it, it keeps the law enforcement community engaged in what ICANN's doing. It keeps the, the creative, the content, you know, engaged there. And so I think that that's just, it's, it's sort of an example of something you can do that shows that there is accountability there. I think part of the challenge with ICANN is what you envision about ICANN is what you want out of it. And so that is becomes, in the, in the bigger question of internet governance, uh, we have seen kind of a, a little petri dish is on the new top level domains that are coming out and are continuing to roll out right now. The, uh, it took seven years to do the uh, draft application guidebook. About year five, the government advisory committee council showed up on the scene and said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, what are you guys doing? It's like, well, we've been doing this for five years. Um, and they created eventually, uh, what was known as the GAC scorecard, the score through things. And you're seeing things happen at ICANN that are really venue shopping in the ICANN forum for other international issues. And that's one of the things that we need to make sure is that ICANN stays on mission. It's a technical coordinating function. It is not meant to be solving the world's problems, that the internet allows for things to happen that certain despotic you know, regimes do not want to see, and so they want to close down the ability to share that information. Or in the case of some of the things that are coming forward, it's a trade dispute. They've lost in the, in the front of USTR, and so they're bringing this to ICANN as a way to solve their problem. Or there are um, certain issues that are just a fundamental disagreement, like dot sucks. 
I think it's a First Amendment right. Other people think that it's holding trademark uh, holders hostage. And, and they're both legitimate points of view. So there's a lot to be discussed in this area. I think accountability and transparency rules going in place that people can really understand what is going on, how, to, how decisions are made. Uh, you know, there's, they're much better. I've been following this for you know, not as long as, as Dr. Crocker, but I've been, you know, been in this space for quite some time. It has gotten a whole lot better, and I think it's going to continue to get better, but we need to force accountability and transparency to be the linchpin that eventually, or the carrot, um, that gets the IANA function forward. Because I think until then, we don't know that there is going to be an, an ability to really manage anything if something happens with the IANA function. The IANA function is working fine. Nobody's complaining about it. That it's a political decision to, to no longer have the US government engaged at that level. And candidly, the engagement is, is very light. So um, you know, there, again, that's just an understanding of what's going on. But if it's something that has been demonstrated that ICANN has a, as an interest in doing, I think we should make sure that they're sticking to their knitting, they're, they're, all the math works, um, you know, the budgets are straight, they're doing compliance, and then we can see them you know, getting more responsibility in this space and, and taking things like the IANA function um, no longer at the Department of Commerce. Sure. Reinhardt, you know, you've got the weight of the rest of the world on you. You look at this panel, we've got a lot of Americans here. Uh, from a European perspective, uh, perhaps you can help us both in terms of internet governance issues generally, as well as uh, obviously we have some ICANN related issues and the like. But as you see these things, you've got a change going on in Europe. We've got Juncker coming in now uh, to, uh, to head up the European uh, Commission. We'll have, he'll be appointing now or nominating uh, heads of the various uh, parts of the European Commission, including uh, Nelly Kluze's uh, successor. We have him now saying that the uh, digital economy is extraordinarily important to the future of Europe. So he's saying right out of the box uh, that this is an important area. From your perspective, where are we going with this? What lessons can we learn from the European experience? Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for including some uh, exotic flavor uh, <laughs> for this uh, panel and some regional diversity. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, let me start with some uh, very brief remarks. And there are some constant misunderstandings or misconceptions when Europeans look at the uh, discussion of the internet governance. And, uh, uh, I think there are two levels. One is, uh, is it all about one, one is substance and topics and issues? So one is, is it all about ICANN or how, how many other topics do we cover in this discussion? How does it matter? And the second one is institutional. So how about the, 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 the processes? How, how about the institutions? And how is, how is the involvement of the institutions? And before you can answer what is the substance and what is the institutions, it's well, kind of hard to predict the future of this whole system. So if we look at topics, uh, we see that there is, a, ship, is included topics of uh, human rights and freedom of speech. Um, definitely the protection of personal data, which as all of you know, is extremely sens sensitive for, for, for Europeans. Um, uh, the question of uh, lawful interception and or versus mass surveillance, uh, which turned uh, very, very interesting, let me phrase it in this word, uh, last year. Uh, Cybercrime, cybersecurity. Uh, standardization and, of course, the functioning and development in, in technical and economic, uh, economic uh, terms of the Internet. And this, of course, brings me back to the interest of a European telecom operator. Um, with regard to procedural structures, um, we're still not sure what the roles of the various stakeholders are. Um, in particular, what is the, the role between, between private the private sector and the public sector, and how is this related to, to, um, to the various topics? So do we have the same structure of stakeholders at every of the above mentioned topics, or will that be, will they have different roles? Um, will that be different, for instance, for cybersecurity, where we see a more important state of the governments and other issues, a more important state of, of private parties? So I think these are answers uh, where our European stakeholders look forward, where they would like to participate and add. Um, secondly, we're also sure, we're also very much convinced about the benefits of the internet, but we're also all aware about the, uh, about, uh, well, forms of abuse of the internet. And I think this is a very important, uh, a very important part of the discussion. So, um, this raises the question of trust 
and the, the trust question has been raised from various parties with different backgrounds. Uh, from the European side, I just want to mention one, one single topic where um, if you look at, uh, if you look at the, uh, well, the interests and the values, for instance, between the US and Europe, they're very close. And sometimes you, you cannot fit a single piece of paper between those two regions. Uh, but there are some topics like, like, like privacy um, where, where there are two or different levels of privacy protection in, in US and Europe. And the question is uh, how, um, how can this be in a way harmonized so that it's first fruitful for the stakeholders and secondly uh, gives business opportunities to invest in future networks and, and so forth. Um, regarding the European regulation uh, on data privacy, its, um, its original sense is, it's always being dis very often being discussed as a kind of market barrier, as a trade barrier, as an obstacle for, for investing into Europe. Its, its, its original purpose is, is an internal use. It's an internal purpose to harmonize, to harmonize 28 member states. So we're not talking about a single, single entity like the United States of America. We're talking 28 member states with 28 various approaches to, to data privacy. So it is first a harmonization, and second a regulation, which is a big difference in Europe because it means regulation gets direct, directly into national law. And um, so we think a balanced approach here by recognizing the interest of the stakeholders and by recognizing, recognizing that Europe's, Europe sees data privacy as a fundamental right of its citizens. I think by recognizing these various approaches for a balanced approach which respects the, 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 different, the, the different viewpoints would be very fundamental and um, this would provide a level playing field for business on both sides. And um, as we all observed, to just mention one, one topic where this is related, um, um, many of us are engaged in the TTIP negotiations as well. And we all have observed that the TTIP negotiations, and particularly the electronic commerce part, had been, uh, well, kind of uh, hindered by the data privacy uh, question. I think so. That I think that uh, to speed up with the, what everybody wants on both sides of the Atlantic, to speed up with the trade negotiations, we need solutions for the, for the privacy questions. So much uh, for the start in raising more questions <laughs> than providing answers. No, no, mm -hmm. terrific, thank you. Th then before moving to the audience for, for your questions, let me ask a general question that seemed to underlie almost all of the presentations that you all gave. The relationship between the role of government, whether it's an individual government, intergovernmental organizations, and the dynamism associated with the internet has been an, ir an important source of discussion, disagreements internationally, but a lot of, a lot of common ground. We see changes going on. Uh, for example, um, at ICANN, we have a proposal that came out on Friday uh, coming out of the uh, cha proposed change in the bylaws that would, in essence, strengthen the GAC by saying that if the board is going to not uh, approve of a GAC recommendation, it now, which only requires now a majority, would go to two-thirds, which would mean that, in fact, the GAC would be strengthened in any proposal coming out. Uh, we see uh, our friends in Iran proposing, among other things, that the GAC should become a decision-making organization. They're making that proposal to the ITU plenipotentiary, uh, an interesting place to make that proposal, uh, as a proposed change to Resolution 102. This is a fundamental issue, it seems, and one that, that uh, involves, touches on all of the presentations. Briefly, can you address, and maybe Steve, if you don't mind, is going first, how you see the relationship between governments and the internet governance uh, system, including, of course, Larry Strickling's statement uh, at the beginning of the transition process, saying that the uh, ICANN cannot be uh, transitioned to a government or intergovernmental organization. Thank you. Um, so this is a very important and, and, and sometimes a somewhat subtle point. Um, it's often thought that the, uh, the tension is between a government only uh, or intergovernmental only uh, management and uh, governance versus a non-governmental function entirely. Uh, we think governance, govern, governments are, uh, are actually useful from time to time, uh, actually have a role to play in our daily society and uh, 
uh, helping um, keep order and uh, structure in society. Uh, I'm, I'm being a, a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, with respect to ICANN, ICANN was very purposefully constructed uh, as a multi stakeholder uh, with a multi stakeholder model. And that multi stakeholder includes governments, and the governments uh, are present in the form of uh, what we call the Governmental Advisory Committee, or the GAC. Uh, and they are there not in a superior fashion, but in a uh, parallel or a collegial fashion with the uh, uh, people from other stakeholder groups, including the at-large advisory committee, which uh, represents internet users overall, and then uh, uh, some of the more specific ones, the business constituency, the IP uh, constituency, and of course the contracted parties, the registries and the registrars, and, and I haven't named them all, there's several others from civil society. Um, the, so that, that puts the, the people who have a very strong orientation from a government perspective in a somewhat uh, novel position. Um, I spent a little bit of time in the government many years ago, and, and I, uh, I think we all understand that when government people get together, uh, they're used to congregating in a, an environment in which they run the, the system and everybody else is kind of outside the room. Uh, and here we very carefully um, uh, have a different role for them. And that different role is not a zero role, uh, but it is not a superior or um, uh, an absolute control. Uh, there is a, a mechanism that we have in which uh, the GAC and indeed other, other parts of ICANN offer advice. And that advice is not just casual, it's, it's taken very seriously. And we built into our bylaws uh, a requirement that if the GAC issues advice, gives advice to, to the board, uh, that the board's required to take it quite seriously. Uh, and if we find ourselves uh, not wanting to accept that advice or having reasons not to accept that advice, we have to first engage in consultations and then we have to be uh, extremely careful in the uh, decision and the documentation of that decision. The, uh, so one of the two things that you, you mentioned, David, is a proposed change in the bylaws to raise the threshold for uh, a formal vote of the board from a, a simple majority to two-thirds if we are going to not accept GAC advice. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we, first of all, we very, very rarely uh, don't accept GAC advice. Uh, sometimes the nature of the advice is that it's uh, a little bit fuzzy or there's some details that need to be ironed out or there's some resource issues and we engage in consultation uh, and, and iron it out. But in the very rare circumstances that we would uh, push back and say, no, we're not going to do that, uh, it would be uh, extremely poor judgment on our part to uh, have a narrow vote in the board. Uh, I don't recall any specific instances in which we've pushed back, but uh, whatever there have been, uh, you, can, you can be certain that we've had either unanimous or nearly unanimous uh, votes, and, uh, and that's been our practice. Uh, so the shifting of the formal threshold from majority to two-thirds is um, really a, a cementing in the bylaws of what has already been a good practice and, and uh, 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 good judgment uh, along the way. And uh, we have no objection to this at all. It's come up in discussion. It came up in, in the uh, first accountability and transparency review team report and again in the second one. And uh, we're, we're, we're now getting around to, to inking that, if you will. Um, exactly along the same line as what I've just described uh, uh, deals with this proposal for, uh, to uh, make the GAC um, have a veto power or have a thing. And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, that would completely transform uh, our operation and the whole idea of a multi-stakeholder model into a governmental uh, controlled, government controlled uh, operation. And that is precisely uh, what uh, is antithetical to the uh, environment that has led to the innovation and expansion <coughs> and enormous uh, positive changes that have taken place across the world uh, for the internet. And uh, so that's just a non-starter. Danny, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit, particularly since the ITU is the quintessential intergovernmental organization, uh, and you're dealing with all of these very technical but very extraordinarily important issues. How do you manage this process and find that sweet spot? 
Well, I think uh, the, in the first instance, the proposals that you're talking about are really fairly extremist proposals are coming out of, a, of countries like Iran and China. And there, there isn't really um, widespread support for the idea of either the ITU or the GAC having veto authority over the decisions of the board of, of ICANN or the community at writ large. Um, I think I appreciate much of, of what's, what uh, Dr. Crocker just said. I think in some sense, um, ICANN has been very careful to pick its fights with the global community of governments uh, as, as it's represented by the GAC. And where it has done so, it has done so on sound terms and, and with the, the vast majority of the support of the board, if not the, the full support of the board. So at the end of the day, um, the, the, the challenge becomes to some degree one of largely of partly of diplomacy partly of policy and partly of negotiation uh, when ICANN was created in 1998 there were only 400 million users of the internet they were predominantly in the United States and Europe if not wholly in the United States and Europe there are today 2.7 billion people on the internet a significant portion of those are not in the United States and Europe uh, there those people's representatives want to have a say in how their people are treated on the global network that is not um, a ridiculous thing to want, uh, and we can have a healthy mechanism by which to include the advice and consultation of governments within the multi-stakeholder system, which is what, what Dr. Crocker talked about, and that's what we're working to achieve. Uh, I think more and more governments are finding that more and more acceptable, and you can see it in their participation at ICANN. And in fact, I would encourage all of you to engage the process. Those of you who have strong ideas about accountability, or those of you who have strong ideas about ICANN, go. How many of you have been to an ICANN meeting? Not good enough. <laughs> I was pretty impressed. The I next one, shocked. by the way, the next <laughs> one's in LA, so your excuse, yeah. you don't have to travel as far as Singapore this time. Was it an invitation, Steve? And, and, and registration is free. Come on. And the, the, the thing about it is, is that ICANN, as Shane has pointed out, is responsible for naming and numbering in the domain name system. None of that builds networks around the world. None of that teaches a kid how to use the internet. None of that creates apps that will encourage additional development. The, those are the true and immediate needs and concerns of the people of the world. Uh, ICANN works extremely well to do something that is extremely hard, uh, which is to manage this extremely diverse group of human beings with immense amounts of personalities. It's worth going to an ICANN meeting. It's worth seeing the, the working methods and procedures and seeing how uh, what is truly a, a very dynamic and small d democratic mechanism for decision making reaches conclusion. It is, it's fair to argue that it is insufficiently inclusive, but it is not insufficiently inclusive as a function of structure. It is insufficiently inclusive because people aren't going. Now, if the people of the developing world want to participate there, not, not only are they more than welcome, we are trying to work out multiple mechanisms by which it can be facilitated for them to do so. And I, th I give immense credit to, to Fadi Shahadi for, for uh, diversifying not just the participation on the board, but the offices around the world and really making a proactive effort to, to bring in people from the rest of the world. But again, internet governance is about dramatically more than naming numbering in the domain name system. Um, and I just want to just want to, Shane knows dramatically more about the IANA functions than I do, but at one point she did say that it's Commerce that uh, is in charge of the IANA functions. Commerce, the Commerce, the Commerce contract verifies that the IANA functions have been executed properly. They, Commerce does not itself execute the IANA functions. And it's, the contract, while incredibly important, is not as um, existentially important as people have made it out to be. And the United States and all of the stakeholders from the United States and Europe that participate in the multi-stakeholder system will continue to do so. So I, I think that to some, and use, use our, our beliefs and our arguments to continue furthering what, what we believe is a functional system that works extremely well. But it does need to become more inclusive and we de do need to do an immense amount of work in areas that are really outside of the realm and remit of ICANN. Anybody else want to comment before we go to uh, questions? Sure. Larry? Just, you know, uh, I think it is the architect Mies van der Rohe who used the expression, less is more. Mm -hmm. And so you asked the role of government and my uh, response in, in, the, in Tom's and my paper, the response, less is more. Uh, that's why we set up the governance structure the way we uh, 
uh, did. Ultimately, of course, if an organization has made an error and somebody wants to try to correct it, there's got to be appeal to somewhere. Right now, it could be to the U.S. courts. And that's not such a bad thing as the Argentine bondholder experience of the past few months has reminded us. Lots of international transactors look to the U.S. legal system. Not a bad place to be looking. And ultimately, of course, governments do have the final say, not only with respect to what happens inside their countries, but through consortia could exercise influence uh, uh, regardless of the nature of the organization. Terrific. But less is more. Okay. Terrific. Let me uh, go to the audience here. Uh, if you could raise your hands, who would ever have a question? Oh, good, Harold. Harold, it looks like. It's hard to see back here. It looks like Harold, yes. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for a, uh, a really uh, informative and well-conducted uh, uh, panel. I do wish to raise uh, one issue which has been uh, something of an issue I know. Um, uh, Steve uh, recommends people go to an ICANN meeting. I agree. Uh, but I will point out that one of the significant barriers uh, to participation from the non-commercial sector has been just money. And this is a systemic problem. It's not just ICANN. It is all of these um, multi-stakeholder fora that we seek to uh, encourage. Uh, and uh, there has been a very strong uh, civil society uh, presence. I know my organization has taken part in it. Others uh, have as well. But uh, it does raise some concerns. And uh, uh, I wonder if the panelists perhaps have some suggestions um, as to how, uh, from a sustainable uh, perspective, uh, we can promote uh, greater engagement uh, by uh, diverse civil society organizations in these multi-stakeholder fora um, in a way that I think everybody agrees both improves their overall uh, uh, performance and frankly, their overall uh, legitimacy. They are seen as more legitimate when there is uh, um, active uh, engagement by civil society. So we used to think that it was about $10,000 to travel internationally to ICANN meeting by the time all the bills were paid. So it is expensive. I'll give you that. Um, ICANN's not having money problems right now. <laughs> and part of that could be, you know, um, and I do know that they, they fund quite a few people to attend an ICANN meeting. The transparency element of how those people are chosen or, you know, what kind of application goes into it and the ability for anyone to see who that gets, who is chosen would probably help free up some of that funding. And I'll admit, I have no, I've never really paid much attention to it. I know it exists. So I know that is an option. The other thing is, to their credit, because they don't have um, financial issues, they've done a very good job with uh, making things available real time. You can pretty much do remote participation. I realize that's sometimes not fun because you're on the wrong side of the clock um, for that. But they, they do now travel with a lot of their own servers and they have the ability to stay up. Even when we were in China, uh, we had great uh, ability within, not only within the conference, but for people to, to watch and observe the conference and participate. So Harold, I take your point, but I think that there is probably some pretty easy to fix mechanisms for those who want to attend to, to make sure that you have the ability to get there. Anybody else want to comment on that? I, I would suggest, because uh, it's an important point, and as Harold indicates, this is true for many international meetings, uh, of course, in this area and, and others, is that uh, for those of you who might be interested in going, but going to the other side of the world is, is daunting for economic and other reasons, the fact that the next meeting in October uh, is in Los Angeles, and as Steve indicated, there is no admission charge, at least gets you in. And, and I think for many of us, it was the first meeting where you learn this, what's going on, and the ability then to participate, whether remotely or otherwise, uh, becomes materially easier and, and more focused. Danny mentioned, uh, you know, sh show up, participate, and I was thinking because it's in LA, maybe we could do it like a studio tour. <laughs> like, and here's the GAC room. Those are the animals. Right? I mean, we could definitely set some sherpas with you, right? Right. Very good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Rick. Uh, actually, to follow up on Harold's point, because it's not just um, NGOs who have dollar problems and budget problems. It's corporations, it's other governments, and the concern that we have had is that there's a, 
an expansion of new fora, like every day being announced, you have to travel someplace different. And it does get to a point where participation becomes difficult, yet if you don't show up, you can be put at a disadvantage. Doing remote, you know, coming in remotely for video, they do a great job, but the fact of the matter, most of the discussions happen outside when their cameras are on. Um, and so if you're not there, we saw this down in Brazil, uh, with our folks on the ground, and thanks to Danny and others who are incredibly helpful down there. But the fact of the matter is, if you're not on the ground participating, you're at a disadvantage, and that's all, that's everybody. And it is getting kind of expensive. It's sort of becoming a rich country, rich man sport of going to fora. And I think at some point, it just needs to kind of slow down, which causes concern about this new initiative, which is the Net Mundial Initiative, and another you know, travel expense um, around the world, and who knows where that will take us. Danny? Um, so you articulate a problem, which is a real problem, which is how do, you, how do you manage, and physically for me to go to all of these meetings, which I do, and for all of us who do that, it's a difficult and, and challenging endeavor. The value, however, of having diffuse meetings and diffuse organizations is that you can agree with people in some places and disagree with them in others. You can effectually execute naming and numbering, um, for example, and, and make the DNS system work and have every device connect to every other device with some general degree of consensus. Have I can do that and then go to the Human Rights Council at the United Nations and have a debate internationally about what the proper what, what the rights and, and responsibilities of governments are relative to people's privacy. For ex that's just an example, and where you would have to dis where you could agree fully with someone on naming and numbering, have a more difficult conversation and a longer negotiation at the United Nations Human Rights Council. The the idea of of creating new initiatives isn't to make you travel; it's to address challenges that have gone unaddressed. If there are institutions that can address those challenges in a way that is, uh, is that would work, great. That would be better, obviously. Um, and I think that, that the Net Mundial Initiative, for example, is an effort at looking at what is possible relative to remaining outstanding challenges that people feel like don't, don't have a home or aren't being addressed adequately. And, and we don't know if it'll work. We're going we're gonna to make our best effort to see, uh, to see what the community wants to do. Um, and, and move forward with that. But again, I would, I would go back to the idea the easiest way to solve the problem you're, you're citing is just go to one place and have one group of people in charge and have all the problems addressed there and pay for everybody to go. And none of that is tenable, nor would it result in good outcomes. But that's my concern is that the developing countries will end up going to the ITU because it's the one place that they can all go to that's already in their budget and they feel comfortable. And one of the things that we've heard is they're like chasing rabbits, and I feel that way. You know, you're chasing all over the place trying to figure this out, and at the end of the day, our concern is that they will pick one place, and they will pick that one place that's most comfortable, which is why we're huge supporters of the Internet Governance Forum, which we thought would help address that problem. And we're huge supporters of the Internet Governance Forum as well. What, what I would say is that um, they shouldn't, the, the idea is to ensure that if you're a particular government, you have limited resources, you also have very specific concerns that you're going to the right places. That doesn't mean there has to be one place for all concerns. Let's so, squeeze in, I'm sorry. Yeah, so better another, mapping another, that out is really the key to ensuring, and, and ensuring that there's a, a map that takes someone somewhere to achieve, to, to look at whatever problem they're trying to solve. And just another comment about why it's important sometimes to not do this in one particular location. When we did the Internet Governance Forum in Egypt, the host committee, uh, just like an offhanded remark said, oh, you know, Internet governance doesn't actually translate in Arabic. Like, we, we have, governance doesn't exist in our land. I'm like, isn't that a problem? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we've picked a phrase that you, doesn't mean anything to you, and we're trying to say it's like a new you know, principle about the internet. And she was like, yeah, well, we'll work around it. To us, it means government. It was a really profound moment. I was like, well, okay, that's good to know. Well, I've we got to work on that. You know. Let's squeeze in one quick question from Jim, and then, uh, then I know the trade panel will, since Reinhardt's already teed up the trade panel already, we need to move on to that. Jim? Yeah, sure. Uh, Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy Group. First off, David, I'm impressed that you picked up ICANN after one meeting. It usually takes most people two to three. <laughs> um, question is on accountability. Steve, I feel like we're, we're coming to a little bit of a standoff on the accountability issue. Um, the ICANN staff has put out their proposal on how to handle the process going forward. The community, registries, business constituencies, 
even the non-commercial stakeholders group, three groups that generally can't agree that the sky is blue, have said that this is not the way to go. It needs to be a community-driven process. So looking at that, how do we diffuse that and how do we move forward in a constructive fashion on this issue? The, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know how many people here are, are familiar with the, precisely the topic that we're talking about, uh, but I alluded to this a little bit earlier with uh, um, when David asked about uh, coordinating committees and uh, how much time we're spending um, trying to decide sort of shape of the table issues and, and before we get on to the real things. Um, we've, we've developed a very, very strong uh, an active uh, set of constituents that are marshaled into stakeholder groups and into uh, supporting organizations. And um, quite rightly and, and quite constructively, there's a strong sense of empowerment uh, that uh, uh, to the point of, gee, everything should be done through that mechanism. As a practical matter, and for, and for another reason which I'll mention, uh, there's a, a proper role for having a staff that takes care of uh, getting things organized so that people can get on with the work. Uh, and that's a piece of what's uh, underlying this tension uh, at this moment of trying to watch the clock and get things organized rather than have endless debate about the process to, to create the process, to create the process, etc. Uh, the other is that uh, the accountability aspect of ICANN is larger than the existing set of stakeholder groups and supporting organizations. And uh, that's a subtle point that has not been uh, brought to light uh, clearly enough. But the community that uh, we're listening to and that we're conscious of is not only the entire ICANN community as it exists, but is the larger community around the world, uh, governments and uh, industry and, and others. And uh, we are, um, I, I would, I would uh, give that we have not been uh, as clear in the um, communication of all this, but it's certainly not to f f um, undermine or undercut the role of the existing uh, processes, but to enlarge and be more inclusive of, of a broader set. So that's what's playing out. It is, frankly, very, very small potatoes because the real work will be once people sit down and start talking about uh, specific issues, uh, and that will be entirely uh, hands off from, from ICANN management and board's perspective. Great. With that, let's thank this tremendous panel for a great job. Thank you.